We now move to the questions. I guess Iram, Sir John O'Dowd, for your case. I call it. Well, can call your case over here. Question number one. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, can I have your indulgence just for a, a moment to say that it is good to be back uh, in the Northern uh, Ireland yeah. Assembly. Um, and what a great privilege and yet a great responsibility to take on the portfolio of the economy. I look forward to working with uh, the members here um, in the Assembly and in particular to the Chair, the Vice Chair and of course the Committee as we try to take forward some very difficult and at times some very exciting issues in relation to the economy. Um, thank you um, for your question. Closing the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme is a complex matter. There are cases currently before the courts, there are also state aid issues and other matters that need to be carefully thought through. My officials are preparing papers outlining all of the issues that will be brought to the executive as soon as possible. I am determined to find a way forward on RHI that is fair to RHI participants that have acted in good faith but also to taxpayers who are funding the scheme. Work to bring forward a new renewable heating scheme will be taken forward as part of a new energy strategy for Northern Ireland. It is important that we get on with the decarbonising of heat as a way forward to our net zero carbon target in 2050. Supplementary question. John um, thank the Minister for her answer. And I also want to congratulate her on her, her appointment. I'm not going to congratulate her on losing her last job. I think we have lost great influence in Europe uh, in terms of our three MEPs, but that's a matter for another day. In terms of the RHI scheme and its closure, I accept the Minister has uh, research and paperwork to do in that regard, and obviously we have to wait the outcome of the RHI report. But whatever replaces the RHI is, yes, it has to protect the taxpayer, but it also has to be environmentally friendly. And there has been serious concern raised in relation to the RHI that not only was it bad in terms of public finances, but it wasn't meeting its targets in terms of the environment. Can I thank uh, the member for the question? Um, we have set um, within the executive and uh, a fairly um, onerous target of uh, zero carbon emissions by 2050. We currently um, are in the process and there is a current call for um, evidence on a new energy strategy for Northern Ireland. We are doing reasonably well in relation to um, electricity. About 45% of our electricity is uh, generated from renewable sources. We are not doing so well in relation to heat. It is therefore really important that we find a fair and equitable way forward on this RHI scheme and also a renewable heat scheme for the future that deals and commits us to um, our, our current targets, but that deals properly and appropriately with all of the issues. I am determined that we will take our time, that we will get the issues right, and that there will be no mis repeat of the mistakes of the past. Uh, Iram Sir Sinead McLaughlin, uh, called Sinead McLaughlin, Vice Chair of Committee. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, I appreciate the complexity of uh, closing down the RHI, um, but has the Minister been able to communicate with the 1,200 businesses that are currently uh, engaged with the project uh, about the imminent closure or, or not imminent closure, because they have to make uh, other arrangements and it's important that they are informed right the whole way through uh, this process of closure? Um, the answer for me personally is no, I haven't engaged with those businesses. I am very relatively new in post. Um, but let me set out some of the complexities and some of the issues that will have to be dealt with as we move forward uh, on the scheme. Um, the, currently, we have two reviews in relation to the scheme, and that is a tariff review that arose out of the Select Committee report uh, in the House of Commons and a hardship review. Those reviews are due to report reasonably soon. Um, and I will share, uh, as soon as I have it available to me, the information with the committee on the outcomes of those particular reviews. Um, we also have um, a 
voluntary buyout um, option uh, for current uh, participants. That uh, voluntary buyout option uh, closed on the 8th of November 2019. I understand that there are 96 applications under assessment by the department in relation to those, but no offers have yet uh, been made. However, we will obviously, in taking forward uh, the scheme, have to consider their position um, in uh, the overall context of, of what uh, we do. So um, there are a number of um, complexities that we have to deal with right now, as well as set out a new renewable heat way forward uh, for the future. I look forward to doing that. I know that my officials have been engaging uh, with participants in the scheme, and I want to ensure that we engage with those participants in a way that is fair, in a way that is compassionate, and in a way that addresses the issues that we have experienced in the past. I call Gordon Dunn. We also welcome the Minister to her new post, and we look forward to working with her as a member of the Economy Committee as we try to build the economy of Northern Ireland. Can the Minister give us uh, an assurance that the, uh, the future of RHA will be fully considered uh, and assessed and give us an assurance that the existing tariffs are now under control? Um, well, um, we currently have the tariff review. Um, the outcome of that is due reasonably soon. Um, we um, are in a situation where currently the current scheme has a current spend of around 7 million out of a budget of just over 28 million. So the actual spend of the scheme is under control. We need to look uh, at the recommendations of the tariff report um, and we will plot a new way forward uh, when we have all of the information that is available to us. Call Trevor Lund. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I can ask the Minister, uh, the new, new approach deal, I forgot the full title, uh, identified the need for the rebuilding of trust and confidence in whatever scheme is brought forward. And a big part of that would be obviously how, how we compensate the perfectly bona fide and legitimate recipients of the current scheme. So can you give us any idea of the amounts of money that's anticipated to be involved and where the money may be coming from? Um, at this stage, it is uh, too soon um, to say uh, how much the closure or any potential closure uh, of an RHI scheme might cost. Um, I do intend to bring forward a paper when we have resolved all of those issues, um, when we have the hardship review, the tariff review, um, and I will do that in a transparent and open manner so that we can all collectively consider how best to take this uh, issue forward. And I am positive, um, given the current financial situations, that the costs of any uh, uh, closure or any future scheme will be of the utmost importance and interest, not just to this House, but to the Executive. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Uh, I do congratulate the Minister on escaping the European Parliament. I'll not go any further than that. Um, could, could I ask her, in relation to a, this glib suggestion of closing the RHI incentive scheme, does she accept that that will drive current participants back onto fossil fuels? Indeed, the reduction below an economic level of the current subsidy has driven many onto forest of fossil fuels. Secondly, does she recognise, particularly from the two pieces of litigation in England, the DAC cases against the Friends of the Earth and the Brayer Group case, that you cannot close the scheme without compensation, and therefore there is going to be a cost to the public purse? And in regard to those matters, she says the two reports, the Cornwall, Cornwall report and the Bugalas report, did I understand it correctly to say her department hasn't received either of those? So there certainly is an impression that they have. 
I have not received the uh, results of the um, hardship report or either or the tariff report. I understand that the tariff report is due to report very imminently, um, in which case uh, those uh, outcomes will be shared with the committee um, and we will take this uh, absolutely forward. Can I just say, in relation to your first point um, uh, around fossil fuels, you are um, absolutely right. We need to be very, very careful that how we proceed going forward does not uh, encourage further dependence or return uh, to fossil fuels. The New Deal, New Approach document um, indicated that uh, closure of the scheme should be considered. I, of course, with my officials, will bring forward all of the options in relation to the scheme. And then the executive can then take an informed decision as to how best to proceed in relation to that scheme. I um, am committed to helping us have a, a low carbon uh, economy here in Northern Ireland. I have no desire to uh, increase uh, the use of fossil fuels within that economy. And that is why I would urge us all to get engaged with the energy strategy going forward. There is a call for evidence in relation to that energy strategy. It is very important that we develop a strategy for Northern Ireland uh, that makes us competitive um, and uh, as environmentally sustainable as we possibly can. Call Mr Steve Aiken. Uh, may I join with our welcome to the Minister and welcome to the Post. Uh, just, just one issue. Uh, how many of the RHI boiler ins uh, installations have now, to this date, been inspected? And how many of them have been found to be compliant? In anticipation of your question. Um, so, to date, um, we have almost 600 sites on the scheme have been uh, inspected. Uh, by the end of June, it's hoped that 880 sites and the remaining by the end uh, of the year. Um, it is a complex issue um, doing the inspections. Um, and when uh, we have the uh, whole of the scheme done, then there will be um, a, a, a full picture on the issue of compliance. Um, there is some information available on that, um, and I will ask uh, my officials to brief the committee on the issue of uh, compliance and the inspections that have been done to date. Here I'm Sir Emma Sheeran for Hunya Cash to call Emma Sheeran for. Gormagat can call you Cash over the Let the whole question to you, please. Thank you uh, for your question. The protocol within the withdrawal agreement will set the terms for our trade in goods. Many issues uh, important to this trade, where businesses will want clarity, are not devolved issues. Um, issues like unfettered access to the UK market, the treatment of goods entering Northern Ireland from GB, access to labour, and access to UK trade agreements are all the responsibility uh, of uh, the national government. It will be the UK government and the EU who agree how the protocol will be practically implemented. The UK government, however, has committed to including the executive on the UK delegation for the Joint Committee. And I will be working with colleagues to make sure that we maximise our influence in relation to this forum. <laughs> I have already uh, taken part in uh, the United Kingdom Trade Forum with uh, Minister Conor Burns uh, and counterparts from uh, Wales and Scotland. Um, and that will be hugely important in ensuring that we have full access to UK trade deals as promised by Prime Minister Johnston. Last Monday, I met Michel Barnier um, here in Northern Ireland, and of course I also met him in the European Parliament in the middle of the week. Um, but um, I again raised those issues of how we treat goods coming in uh, to Northern Ireland. This is an issue of the absolute utmost importance. It is imperative that we work together to make sure that these issues are dealt with 
uh, in the coming months. And there is very little time to actually work on the issues. So let me assure you that I will be working with the wider business uh, community, with the committee and with executive ministers to ensure that Northern Ireland's case is forcefully represented and its interests protected as we go forward in this transition period. I'm thinking specifically of uh, some firms that are involved in parallel importation, so the business of um, importing a product into the north from an EU state, repackaging it here and then exporting it for trade in the 26 counties, obviously another EU state. And I'm just wondering, because I know of a firm, particularly in my own constituency, that are worried at the minute and don't know how to prepare for the future, when they're going to receive detailed guidance and if uh, your department will be offering this. I, of course, am very happy if you write to me about the very specifics uh, of that case um, to have officials look at it and see how we can make progress. I understand that for businesses, it, one of the greatest things that they can have going forward is certainty about how they do business and the manner in which they do business and the forms, etc., and the processes that they have to go uh, through to actually um, do uh, that business. Um, so I will be very happy to respond individually. Perhaps as an aside um, to your question, um, and I think that um, it is interesting um, this morning that the Prime Minister and the European Commission set out their opening positions on negotiations on the future economic relationship between the UK and the EU. Um, and clearly um, this was um, set out for a negotiation purpose. And there are key issues for us uh, that will be very, very important going forward. <clears throat> and uh, again, it is absolutely important. There is, in terms of the Northern Ireland economy, this is the key issue that we will need to deal with going forward. Unfortunately, I'd have to say, because it is a negotiation, the situation cannot sometimes appear fluid more than businesses would want. I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And can I welcome the minister to her place and uh, give her every best wish going forward? We look forward to welcoming her to the committee uh, this week. Uh, as well as engaging with local businesses and giving them advice on import and export, one of the key priorities of her department going forward will be the promotion of exports from Northern Ireland. Can the minister outline for the House how she sees Invest NI? tying in with that and what plans she has for a revised international strategy to encourage businesses in Northern Ireland to take advantage of the opportunities that Brexit will uh, provide. Can I thank uh, the member for his question. Um, it is uh, hugely important that we recognise uh, and sometimes we talk of the difficulties but that Brexit will uh, present um, new opportunities as well. By far the most important market for Northern Ireland is our GB market. So around 70% of everything that we will make or grow or produce is sold within the United Kingdom. About two thirds of everything that we will bring into Northern Ireland um, is from GB, whether that is for the marketplace or it is for the high street. So the most important thing and the thing that is uppermost in my mind at this minute is securing the access to those markets so that the Prime Minister's promise of unfettered trade is actually a reality. The Prime Minister also promised uh, us uh, in his uh, statements that one of the things that we would have is access to UK trade deals going forward. And that is why I participated last week, along with uh, the Minister at the Department for International Trade, Conor Burns, counterparts in Scotland and in Wales, uh, on this issue of setting up a UK trade forum. I want Northern Ireland to benefit from uh, global uh, Britain. I want Northern Ireland to be able to take part in those trade deals. And as an aside, uh, this week, uh, I am meeting a delegation from Qatar to strengthen trade relationships uh, with that part uh, of the world. I think there are many exciting opportunities going forward 
um, and we will work to maximise those, not just to protect Northern Ireland and GB, but to work on our global profile. I call Matthew O'Toole. Hear him, sir, Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, like others, I'd like to welcome the Minister to her, uh, to her position. She has a busy um, period ahead of her. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, no independent economic forecaster has ever produced a credible forecast that shows an economic benefit either to the United Kingdom or to Northern Ireland from leaving the European Union. Can I ask, um, that the minister, uh, as a matter of urgency, that the Minister a asks economists in her department to provide robust economic analysis of the various scenarios that face Northern Ireland in the years ahead, including possible GBNI east-west barriers that she produced, they produce independent uh, economic analysis that she can bring before the Assembly that we can use to debate the best possible um, future for Northern Ireland and, and, and how we affect the negotiations that she's talked about. Can I uh, thank the member uh, for his question? The member undoubtedly takes a particular view of Brexit. Um, however, Brexit for us here in Northern Ireland now is a fact. We have left the European Union. And what we need to do is to work together to ensure that Northern Ireland will maximise its potential in the years going forward. So that is absolutely my most important priority at this minute in time. There are many um, economic analyses of where we might be in any particular uh, scenario. Some of those have not worked out that particularly well or even been that accurate in relation uh, to the impact of Brexit. However, um, what we will do when we see how um, the Joint Committee develops, how the negotiations develop, and exactly the nature of the trading relationship between the UK and the EU, um, then we will be bringing forward our own analysis and recommendations in uh, light of that. And can I say, just as a, an add-on to that, my own particular view of this is that we may have left the institutions of the European Union, but we have not left Europe. We will still continue to trade with Europe. We will still to continue to work on security with Europe. We will still continue to work on the really important issues like human trafficking uh, and many other uh, items. So it is absolutely important um, that we get on ahead, maximise our potential and grow Northern Ireland's economy. I call John Stewart. Speaker, and can I too congratulate the Minister on her new role? I look forward to working with her on the uh, Economy Committee. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the comment over the weekend from Stena about their concerns about the limitations at the ports here in Northern Ireland. Is it likely that extra space for checking goods will be required at our ports in Northern Ireland? And what discussions has the Minister had with port operators on these matters? We, um, in, in deciding what we need to do in Northern Ireland, we'll need to see the outworking of the protocol. The Prime Minister has promised us unfettered access. Um, I think the Executive needs to hold the Prime Minister to his word uh, and let us see what unfettered access means. I understand um, that uh, ports um, see uh, both restriction and opportunity in the situation that we're currently in. Um, and I, I, of course, will be talking to them in the future uh, to ascertain their exact needs. To question three, and I call Joanne Bunting. Deputy Speaker, question three, please. Can I thank the um, member for her question? The tourism and hospitality sector has experienced steady growth since 2013 and plays an important role in the Northern Ireland economy. In 2018, there were an estimated 5 million overnight trips in Northern Ireland. Estimated expenditure associated with these trips was a record-breaking 968 million. As Minister with Responsibility for Tourism, I am aware of the potential impact of the proposed rates revaluation on the sector. It is my intention to meet with a, key, a number of key stakeholders from the sector to discuss a range of issues impacting the tourism and hospitality business. 
Uh, supplementary, Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister has made mention of uh, the very real fears within hospitality that the result of Reval 2020 may be that hard-won growth is smothered and in some cases that some businesses may be forced to close. Will she also undertake to make representations to the Minister of Finance on behalf of the sector to see what might be done to avoid and or minimise such an outcome? Thank you. Um, I can confirm that I do have a meeting with the Minister for Finance later on this week um, and we will no doubt be discussing uh, these issues. Thank you. I call John Blair. Thank you. And can, can I, like uh, others before me, uh, congratulate the Minister on her appointment and wish her very well for the times ahead. Can I, uh, Deputy Speaker, ask the Minister if she supports, uh, in relation to the hospitality sector, reform of licensing legislation in Northern Ireland? And then in addition to that, if she's likely to report soon on a recent review of that legislation? My understanding is that uh, that is an issue for the Department for Communities. Yep. Um, but uh, I, of course, uh, will be happy to uh, give a view. I want the sector to grow, to develop um, and to grow Northern Ireland. This sector is responsible uh, for around 65,000 jobs in Northern Ireland. It's important that we support the sector uh, and that we allow it to grow uh, in the best way possible. The Department for Communities is the department in relation to the licensing issue. Hiram Sir Pat Chatney, I call Pat Chatney. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Minister, and I also welcome you to your post. I was engaged in the hospitality sector all of my work in life and I can tell you now Minister there is real fear out there and I ask you to engage with that sector in order to look at a fair level playing field. I feel that they have been really hard done by but my question to you is Minister that um, will the Minister engage as a matter of urgency taken on board what I've already said there, with the Minister of Finance and the Executive in the development of a new and innovative business rating system that is fit for purpose in our modern day economy? Um, I will, of course, uh, engage uh, on this particular issue. I understand um, the hardship that sometimes this can bring, uh, particularly to small businesses who, who are impacted uh, from my department as well as uh, the hospitality sector. Um, so I will, of course, engage with the Minister for Finance, and I suspect the Minister for Finance will be getting a significant number uh, of questions uh, around this particular issue. I call Cahill Boylan for... Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, let a hold question number four, please. Mr Speaker, uh, with your permission, I would like uh, to group questions AQ uh, 45 and 53. Um, they're on uh, a very similar um, issue. Um, I am committed to protecting vulnerable workers, um, especially those whose only choice is to accept zero hour contracts which do not guarantee any hours and prevent them from uh, working elsewhere. This uh, seems somewhat unfair, um, particularly to those whose uh, options are limited in relation to the times and hours that they are able to, to work. My officials are going to develop policy options, taking into account best practice, and uh, we will provide advice in due course. Um, I am also sure that the committee will take a particular view of this issue um, in the fullness of time. Uh, just for clarity, that's to group numbers 4 and 12 and 5 and 13, Minister. I think that's the case. So, very brief supplementary from... Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. I'm going to thank the Minister and wish her well in her new post. Just in terms, will she ensure that she engaged with the key sectors? to ensure that a process like this will roll out smoothly and they'll have a fine, better understanding of our mill market. Thank you. I can ensure the members that I will um, engage with uh, key sectors um, and um, try to understand in bringing forward options 
and potentially even legislation um, into how these things impact on families and on lives and on real people um, in our communities um, and the fullness of time. Thank you. Uh, we now move to topical questions. I guess here I'm Sir Emma Sheeran for your question. Emma Sheeran. Gorham, I get last time, Corlea. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I know we've touched previously on the uncertainty uh, in the current period following our exit from the EU on Friday pass, but um, just along the same line, I want to ask the Minister whether your department is going to be providing um, financial assistance to firms who are finding themselves in the situation where they require um, massive adaptations to their business model in order to continue trading post uh, leaving the EU. Can I thank the Minister for the question? Um, in uh, the New Deal New Approach, it was indicated that there should be compensation for firms in relation to the costs uh, associated with uh, the implementation of any new systems. Um, I intend to take this forward with uh, colleagues. Tomorrow morning uh, will be the first meeting of the Brexit subcommittee. Uh, from the executive, uh, and I know that this will be uh, part of the considerations uh, in the overall package. It is important that the government live up uh, to its commitments in uh, the New Deal, New Approach, uh, and actually uh, look after businesses in Northern Ireland that might have to change their way of operating. Supplementary question. Um, I, uh, I welcome uh, your commitment and uh, thank you for that. I, I just am concerned about some firms who um, are looking potentially at a, at a move to the 26 counties um, as opposed to retaining their, their current business in the north. And I'm wondering that in the instance where a firm finds themselves looking at a move south as their only viable option, if there would be financial assistance to um, try and maintain the jobs that they're currently providing in their, in their base in the north? All of these issues will probably have to be looked at, uh, or the issues you express, on an individual basis. Again, um, we can direct that to the appropriate uh, department or to Invest Northern Ireland to have a look at it if you want to contact me directly. Mr George Robinson, for questions. Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, could I first and foremost congratulate the Minister on her appointment as Economy Minister? And can I ask, will the Minister confirm if parental bereavement leave is to be introduced in Northern Ireland? Sorry. Um, can I again uh, thank the member uh, for uh, their question? Um, in um, April of this year, it is anticipated that um, a new uh, arrangement will be brought in in uh, the rest of the United Kingdom um, around the issue of uh, parental leave. Um, this will allow leave uh, for bereaved parents uh, who are employees and um, who will be entitled to two weeks leave following the loss of a child under the age of 18 or a stillbirth after 24 weeks of pregnancies. Employees with 26 weeks continuous service will be entitled to receive statutory pay while absent from work. I think that equates to around £151.20 per week in 2021. Um, at present, there is no corresponding legislation in Northern Ireland. However, it is my intention that parental bereavement leave will be introduced here, and I have asked officials to bring forward proposals to me for my consideration. Um, as a matter of urgency. I think that this is the right and the proper thing to do. Currently, the Employment Rights uh, Northern Ireland Order 1996 gives a day one right for an employee to have a reasonable time off work to deal with an emergency such as a bereavement involving a dependent. An employer does not have to pay an employee for this time away from work, but many employers already offer paid, special or compassionate leave. As Minister, I want to encourage employers to continue to assure, ensure that their employees are treated uh, with compassion. Statutory parental bereavement leave introduced in Northern Ireland would ensure that all employees are able to avail of parental bereavement leave should they find themselves in a difficult circumstance of the loss of a child. 
Mr. Robertson, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I'm sure the Minister would agree that at such a dramatic and difficult time for parents and families, parental bereavement leave would provide much needed time for parents to help grieve for their loved one and to sort out the domestic problems for the bereaved family. Yes, absolutely. Um, actually, when this was first brought to my attention, I actually couldn't believe in this day and age that we didn't actually have statutory provision on this particular issue. Um, I think that it is the right thing to do. I know that I will have the support uh, across the House in relation to this. Employment law should be fair to employees and to employers, but it also needs to be compassionate. Um, and I will be bringing this forward as soon as I can. Mr. John Blair. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. C can I ask the uh, Minister what action um, she intends to take to ensure that, um, as referenced in Annex 4 of the New Decade New Approach Agreement, there would be uh, an economic strategy? And can I ask how that will uh, relate to all of our constituencies, for example, and all of our communities, in particular our rural communities, which, by the way, don't get a mention at all in that agreement? Um, I absolutely am committed to bringing forward a, a new strategy for Northern Ireland. I want uh, a dynamic economy going forward that brings benefit, prosperity to all of our people uh, here in Northern Ireland. I think that that is of the utmost importance. Um, and yes, um, as someone who in the European Parliament took a very keen interest uh, in our rural communities, um, then I would want to ensure that that dynamic is extended into all of those rural communities. Um, I was reviewing, uh, for example, Project Stratum uh, with officials uh, in the department, and that actually uh, aims to look at delivering broadband into um, communities where there is um, slow uh, speeds of broadband, poor connectivity. 90% of that delivery will be in rural areas. And I think that that shows the commitment that we have to increasing um, the economy and growing the economy in rural areas of Northern Ireland, as well as increasing productivity, which is absolutely key to growing. John Blair, supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? Can I ask, in addition to, to, to the point made, uh, if I could be assured that the economic strategy, as it evolves, will link to other strategies in other departments, so that uh, matters like infrastructure, education, and, uh, and other social issues in the Department for Communities are, are also considered as well as uh, relevant to that strategy. We're in free. Um really in danger of a case of uh, consensus breaking out across the house uh, with my colleague. Yes, any economic strategy has to relate to all communities in whatever way they find them. Um, and that is very important. Can I mention two pieces of work uh, that my department will be bringing forward in uh, the next number of months? Two, I think, very key pieces of work. And that is a strategy for 14 to 19 year olds uh, in education, skills and training. And I think it is absolutely important that uh, the Department of Education and the Department of Economy uh, with responsibility for further and higher education work together to deliver valid pathways for all of our young people uh, going forward. Um, there, I am currently reviewing work um, on uh, the training um, programs that will be delivered um, by the department. Uh, and again, I want to assure the member of my commitment um, to all communities in this particular area, because I want to ensure that we have education at community level, whether it's traineeships or general education, that is driven also by the community, so that everyone can participate within those programs and thereby find themselves better placed on the ladder of work. Mr. William Irwin, for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I congratulate the Minister on her new post and indeed her first question time. Can I ask the Minister to give an update on the progress towards the opening of the new SRC AMA campus? Um, I am absolutely delighted that um, 
in uh, my department, we are currently have a capital spend of over 200 million um, in relation to new facilities um, for further education uh, in Northern Ireland. I visited um, two Fridays ago the campus uh, at Upper Ban um, in Banbridge, and it's very exciting to see there a new hub for digital learning that uh, will be taken forward and that will open uh, in September. Um, again, the campus in Armagh is due to open this year as well, so I think that those are hugely exciting uh, prospects to improve um, education, training and skills for our young people and match those skills with the help of employers to the needs of our economy. William Irwin, supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. Well, the Minister, I'm sure, will agree with me that it's important that our young people get the best possible education and training as they face a competitive world in a, in a modern economy. I absolutely do, and, and I think that, um, if I can add to that, um, we not only need to ensure that um, formal education, community education, further education and higher education are linked but that they are driven also by the needs of the economy. So we are training young people for real jobs uh, while we seek out uh, better uh, and uh, more um, better enumerated jobs uh, within this economy. So it is really important that we lay the foundation blocks. Um, and as an old teacher in another life, which seems a very long time ago now, um, education is absolutely fundamental for progress for our young people. Mr. William Humphrey for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I congratulate the Minister, post and welcome her to the dispatch box. Can I ask the Minister for her view on traineeship and skills for life and work? Can I thank uh, the member uh, for his question? As I alluded to um, in an earlier question, um, this is something that I have been reviewing uh, with uh, officials in my department. There is some concern about the progression levels from the level one into the level two uh, aspect um, of this and how those can be delivered and whether they can be delivered um, in community settings. I hope to bring forward uh, proposals that are flexible, that allow people to progress at, this, at the pace and in the place where they are best placed to make that progress. I know, um, and he and I have visited and been part of those community training schemes like Impact on the Shankle um, for a very long time. Um, they do an enormous amount uh, of work with young people within the area, um, and I congratulate them on their work. And I look forward to working with them and indeed visiting some of them um, in the near future. Time for a quick supplementary, Mr. Holmes. It's funny you mention that, Minister. Can I? Uh... <laughs> Can I take this opportunity, having met with the management uh, of Impact Twin recently, along with senior officials from your department, can I take this opportunity to express my concern as they're concerned about some potential proposals which may be emanating from your department, and therefore take this opportunity to welcome you to a, a visit Impact Training as my, my uh, guest in the near distant future? I would be absolutely delighted to visit Impact Training. For me, it's going to my political home, um, and I would be absolutely delighted to do that. And can I say thank you for your kind words to all of you colleagues across the chamber on this, my very first question time. Okay, members, that concludes uh, topical questions. And if members just take their ease while we change the chair here. Thank you.